Hello and welcome to today's uh, program, Global Connections, as the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston hosts a conversation with Bruce Fullen of Argus Media. I'm Sandia Bayou, Chief Development Officer here at the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston. Again, happy Friday and our hope that you, your family, everyone around you is being safe and staying healthy. And now I'm sure you will agree more than ever, it is important to stay informed about what is happening, not only our city, but all around the world. And the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston brings foreign experts and those conversations right into your home or your office, where it might be. With that, Bruce, welcome. Thank you, Sonny. I appreciate uh, you inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's again my absolute pleasure and honor to host you today. First thing first, how are you, your family, and the team of Argus Media doing in this uh, current environment? Uh, thank you for asking. I mean, yes, it's been a quite an adaptation over the past year in this environment. Uh, Argus, we are still primarily our employees are working from home. So am I today. Um, you know, my, my child still goes to school and online on the internet, but we've uh, learned to all kind of adapt to the new changes quite quickly. And, uh, you know, I can't quite say it's business as normal, but our product and services are 100% operating back online. So it's been just business as different. And uh, it's been, you know, quite a, an interesting change in the past year. But, you know, personally, me and my family have been doing well under the, the circumstances. We've gotten used to just some of the different changes that have come along the Houston lifestyle here. But we... Uh, Definitely am glad uh, to still be, you know, our company's functioning well and be part of the news media services that we provide to the community. Right, that, that's really good to hear. Uh, for our viewers, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen again, the Q&A, and I'll be keeping an eye on those questions that uh, come in. Again, thank you for that. Um, Bruce, you are an analyst with Argus Media here in Houston. Uh, now, as I understand it, uh, Argus is best described as an independent media organization, which provides price assessments, market data, and analysis of international energy and other commodity markets. Uh, it's headquartered in London, uh, more than 26 offices uh, worldwide, uh, kind of in the world's principal commodity trading and production centers, including, of course, here, your office in Houston. Um, could you briefly tell us a little bit more in detail, perhaps what exactly Argus Media is and what it does and you know, who your audience and clients are? Yeah, sure. Um, Argus Media, to, to describe it, um, its primary responsibility is a price reporting agency. So let's define what is a price reporting agency. Um, the primary function of what we do is we gather information on various commodities, um, whether it's wood, oil, gas, uh, around in Houston, of course, we got refining hydrocarbons. And what we do is we create assessments or indexations of those commodity markets, uh, not just here, but as you described, we have offices around the world. And so in Houston, we gather the information on those commodities. Um, so, you know, most of you are probably familiar with natural gas or gasoline, diesel, biofuels, crude oil, and what we do is we use uh, various methodologies um, that are established by Argus to publish prices on those every day. In, in addition to that, while we're collecting information how to value something such as crude oil or gas, we also have a stellar group of reporters and journalists that write news around the world or here locally um, on, about the various commodities um, to support and go along with those price assessments that we have. But to just kind of give you a stand back level, Argus does around about 10,000 price assessments a day with around 200 publications a day. Wow. So you can imagine when people talk about commodities, we are one of the leading experts in the world who as we have eyes and ears literally around the world. That's some impressive numbers on, on, on daily scale. I can't even comprehend that many reports, I guess. <laughs> It, it is. And then, you know, our, our clients are used. So going back to when people trade commodities, you know, the basic concept is you have producers. So people, whether they produce wood or they produce oil or crude out of the ground, and then you have your, your buyers. Um, those buyers are generally for crude oil. It's like refineries. Um, and in between, sometimes you have what you call trading houses or speculators or midstream companies because 
you, you may have someone that produces oil in the ground, you have a refiner that buys, but you need pipelines and transportations or midstream companies in the middle to move those oil and, and, and gas barrels to the market. So we interact with all those folks, including people that speculative, take trading positions, banks in New York that want to hedge. We've got a lot of uh, governments that rely on our prices, um, whether they're national oil companies or they use them for simply things like taxation and royalties. There's got to be a value established fairly in the market. So our clients are the ones that trust us that we make fair and neutral price assessments um, on these commodities globally, worldwide. And that's a big function of what I'm in charge of and that I do here in Houston. Um, I oversee and I specialize in crude oil, but I, again, I'm very familiar with all our variety of commodities that we have to do from our office. And you actually kind of already started down the path of my conversation, which is, I want to talk to you specifically, you know, right, right now, thank you again for kind of sharing the updates on Argus itself. Uh, as we mentioned, you are an energy analyst uh, here in Houston. You are actually a native Houstonian, born and raised here. You even studied management of U of H here, and uh, you actually serve on the board of U of H Board of Advisors. You also earned your MBA from University of Moscow. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your journey including Moscow, uh, how you became involved in energy sector and how you found your way to Argus Media. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to say I'm a cliche. I mean, the, one of the things that people think of Texans is that we're just kind of a, a local regional type breed, but to be honest, Houston, where I grew up, um, you know, we're a very international city and always have been. So I, I guess I could say probably, you know, I started, um, graduated in Katy High School in 1991 or 92, actually I graduated as a senior, but in 1991, the Soviet Union broke apart. My father had worked for one of the biggest gas companies in the United States uh, called Teneco at that time, which later became El Paso. So I just kind of grew up in the oil and gas patch like so many other children did in the greater Houston area. Uh, my school was very international, even back in Katy. I mean, because a lot of the students, uh, their parents worked at oil and gas companies and they came from all parts of the world. So I was kind of used to a lot of the diversity and understanding of oil and gas, even from a young age. But then, uh, you know, after the Soviet Union broke up, um, I ended up starting school at Houston Community College and um, University of Houston at the same time. Both those scholar or schools are quite interesting because for a community college, it was rated as one of the top most international colleges in America, mm -hmm. right here in Houston at the community college level. So again, it drew in students from the entire world and a lot of them again were connected into the petrochemical sector and, and industry. So, you know, I, I studied in the academics in the normal school, things like geology and science, and I knew I had an interest in that when I was young, but I also kind of liked having international friends and diversity that Houston that I grew up in offered. So, you know, I, I lived on campus at the University of Houston. Um, even during that time, later I ended up taking an internship with the Department of State, and I worked in the embassy in Tbilisi, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So my career path just kept kind of going down that that international background. And I worked for various oil companies like Marathon Oil when I, my, uh, after I graduated and before I went to Moscow, um, I was working on one of their projects from Sakhalin Energy, uh, which was an East Island in, in Russia. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of encouragement from that big international company said, yeah, go get your MBA. We'd love to, to have people that are very international and diverse. You know, people come from all around the world. We do need Americans to, you know, kind of come back in different parts to kind of bridge those gaps. So I ended up, you know, learning to speak Russian. I went to college at the University of Moscow and I, I completed an MBA there. And so for me, that was uh, just the beginning of where I kind of began to realize that, you know, as a young person, I knew I liked the international business perspective. I knew I liked the, the different languages. I, I knew I liked the oil and gas sectors. So I continued to work into that. So I ended up most of my career working for major oil companies, most of them here in Houston, but you know, I started off in Shell trading uh, or Equiva trading back then. And you know, it was involved in gasoline uh, sales and distillate sales in the United States, moved on to an oil refining company called Premcor, which was one of the domestic large ones. Mm -hmm. ConocoPhillips later in my career, 
Conoco, I ended up working as a crude strategist globally for the company as ConocoPhillips had oil and gas drilling all around the world and refining around the world. So it just kept drawing into where I wanted to go. Uh, from there, I went to a company called British Gas or B, uh, BG Group. Um, I worked on their uh, Brazilian oil projects. And again, our office, you know, that office was in London. I began more and more in the international community. Um, I went from there to one more place was at the PetroChina, which was ranked the largest oil company in the world. But here in Houston, with my international background, it made sense to keep working with the international community. And after putting all those years of international experience uh, in the trading sector, um, you know, I decided to make a move into Argus. And effectively, when I was at Argus with price and indexation, I was familiar with them because I'd worked with them as a client for you know, my entire career because pricing was critical to anywhere I wanted to go for studying economics, balances, uh, pricing. Uh, so to me, it was kind of a natural fit. And from the position I'm here, you know, I look at crude prices globally around the world, which is very critical to the Houston market, but of course is very important to the global market as well. So it took me a a long hitch to get through that. So, you know, I enjoyed the diversity in uh, the, the career that I've had so far to just take me around the world. But, you know, coming from the, the kid that grew up in Katy, Texas over here, all the way, you know, to oil industries around the world, the thing is you can explore the world, but as I could prove, like I'm still a local, normal Houstonian, but I mean, we are a, a diverse group and an unusual group, even of ourselves in Texas. So I'm proud to kind of be a, a, a good representative of the oil and gas community here locally. Wow, that's a fantastic journey. And it's only not even done when you think of all of the, the globe that you have touched and you can be in, in touch with, very much like we, the World Affairs Council. Um, getting into some of the, the very technical aspects, something to already mention and what you do, when examining commodities, we hear about crude, crude benchmarks, tracking the price of crude or WTI, which is the West Texas Intermediate. Most uh, economists uh, would view crude oil as the most important commodity in the world. You said that much of what you do is validation and indexing, but for us others, what does this really all mean? If you could give us a, a brief kind of oil 101 refresher to explain some of this terminology, and of course, why is it so important? Well, we got to go back to breakdown. Yeah, let's go to basics. Yeah. What, is, what is crude oil, right? And crude oil itself is a, it's a hydrocarbon. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a pretty much only one function for crude oil, and that is to burn in a refinery to make energy. So the source of energy, when you look at hydrocarbons is basically what we're looking at uh, crude oil. It's just a liquid form of energy in itself. And we at Argus, you know, the big part, what the world asks us to do is to do valuation on these. So when I look at crude oil itself, I start with it's, it's a hydrocarbon, it's a liquid, and you got to start like, well, it's a little bit more complicated than just a straightforward measurement. Crude oil itself, when you, you know, you can obviously say there's hydrogen, there's carbon molecules, but when it's in the ground and it's a liquid, it can take in vanadium, nickel, sulfur, all kinds of chemical properties that you have to be very familiar with. Some of these, um, you know, are things that they want to extract from the crew that may not be great for the environment. For example, sulfur, you don't want that in the air to have a sulfur dispersion. You want to lower emissions where you can, and you want to do what's environmentally friendly. But the reality is crude itself, is you know a very very old chemical processed under the ground you know for millions of years and when we extract it out of the ground we have to try to decide what it's worth and Argus we do have some criteria for example when you look at something like WTI crude that really does stand for West Texas light and that generally uh, shows us or points to the crude in a big area out in West Texas in the Midland Odessa area called Permian Fermion is one of the largest oil fields in the United States. And what we do is we look at things like the API and the sulfur to make sure that it's within a special uh, qualification. If the API is too high or too low or the sulfur is too high or too low, we can't evaluate that group fairly or equally against uh, the things that should be similar to compare an apples to apples calculation. So 
What is API? API, um, just you know, for user or people that may not be familiar with this, just the gravity of the crude. How heavy is it? How light? So, a typical barrel of uh, WTI crude is generally between a 37 to a 42 degree API. Now, for the users or the people out there that may not know, you know, what that means. Well, to give you an idea, water is a 10. I just consider it's the perfect drink of the planets, right? So water. Um, so, and we all know crude is lighter than water. So 42 API, it just means it's lighter. It will float on top of water. And then sulfur is something that you really want very little of it. You can't have sulfur in your gasoline. We can't have it for emissions. Uh, we can't burn it. It would be stinky. I mean, so it's not an element that we want in our gasoline. So when you look at crude, you have to pay to remove that sulfur in the processing of the refineries. Um, so it, we have to give it a discount on what it is. So when you look at West uh, WTI, it's a, a West Texas intermediate. Intermediate means a medium size uh, or gravity oil. It's, uh, it's also low sulfur. So we call it a light sweet crude. And uh, so, you know, those are the chemical properties that we look at, for example, at that, but it's just more than just the chemicals. We got to look at the location. Taking that one barrel of crude, for example, that's um, developed out in the Midland area, we do assess the price of that crude in Midland. Mm -hmm. um, and we work with the local people, the producers, the people at storage tanks and the trading activity out there every day. Uh, we gather the purchases and sales for the type of crew that fits the, the, the methodology and the criteria we have, and we assess it at that location, at that day, at that time. Um, but it's not just on there, like the WTI that most of you all see on the screens is uh, when you think of the big headlines news is the one actually in Cushing, Oklahoma. It's not even in Texas. And that's because historically the oil used to leave West Texas and go up to Cushing, Oklahoma for the refining industry up in the Chicago type area in there. And so to fill that center part of the demand, the United States many years back used to import a lot of oil from around the world to, to go into the United States and into the interior. Well, times have changed and yes, they have. So that same crude oil now barrel is actually assessed down in Houston and that we do the same assessment to make sure it's similar quality crudes as the other locations. We assess it once it's on the water. We assess the WTI crude in Rotterdam. We assess the WTI crude over in uh, Ningbo as well. You know, so that crude, that one barrel of crude out of West Texas is then suddenly become global around the world mm -hmm. because the demand for that crude and that quality, it, it reaches global markets and it becomes very interesting that when people use these prices and assessments, they look all around the world. And, um, you know, the other thing is when you talk about economists, you know, does crude really make a difference to the world? Yes, crude highly correlates to the company or country's uh, GDP. So economists look at this as a stick and a benchmark every time you go around the world as a critical commodity. You know, I mean, just fundamentally, you go back to there's only one place crude oil can go and it's a refinery. Well, refineries make jet fuel, they make gasoline, they make diesel. Well, when the demand goes down in a sector, let's say, you know, COVID impacts and people aren't driving as much to work, well, the price of oil falls with it because the commodity it's making gasoline from the crude oil just doesn't have the demand and things are supply demand driven. So economists are always looking at where the crude oil is because every country in the world has a deficit of energy. Every place in the world wants more and more energy. And part of that is hydrocarbons. So since uh, hydrocarbons are easily moved, they're highly available. You could drill and get them pretty easily. And quite honestly, they're reasonably affordable that the whole world does depend on the hydrocarbon industry. And so we look at crude oil um, to go ahead and you know, drive the economy or the fuel engines for many places around the world. So it's been an interesting journey watching that uh, on the GDP and, and the growth indications and the correlations. Um, you know, some things that I even look to myself is, you know, the United States, you know, is a first world country. Europe is a first world country. And you can see the consumption that they have of this energy or hydrocarbons is very, very high. Other world places like such as in Africa or third world countries, they consume a lot less uh, hydrocarbons because their economy just is not to the same economic and quality of life standards that we have here. 
So of course, everybody wants to lift their quality of life. Everybody wants improvement and can uh, consume more energy around the world. So hydrocarbons is just one part of that. And so when people look at the demand of the economies, it's very easily to look at the price of crude and the demand of the crude for that country to see where the direction that they're going to be going, if they're going up or down, if they're in growth or if they're in recession. Absolutely. Thank you. This is very, very useful. And it's, uh, again, uh, amazing to hear how connected one has to be or your, your industry, your company, your, you yourself to what is happening in the pulse of, of, of the world to uh, create these predictions and, again, watch supply and demand. Um, switching gears a little bit, we are now 14 months or so into pandemic, and I'm sure you will agree that uh, we cannot have further or honest or different conversation about economy, markets, trade, state of global affairs without discussion, of course, of, of the global crisis of COVID-19. It's uh, no secret that 2020 was an extremely challenging year for all of us, and particularly for the oil industry. Um, things are certainly better now and they are than they were in May 2020, but I'm sure you will agree that we are not really fully recovered yet. Um, would you share with us your experience of this past year of 2020 and in, your, in terms of work and from unique view of uh, Argus Media perhaps? And could you talk about the right. significance of April 20 of 2020? If I'm sure you recall, that was the day when we got negative price per barrel. Uh, first ever such thing as well. So it's, it's a big subject matter that I'm opening here, but it's kind of the, the last year of you and, you know, on to where we are going. Yeah, I, I trust me. I remember that day very well. <laughs> really negative, but uh, we'll start what kind of happened earlier. And, uh, you know, as COVID spread through that, the United States, um, our company, whether or not we realized that we're better prepared than most companies, um, just because of the fact that news and media was always mobile, they're always on the go. But in you know working here in Houston, um, we're not tied to a physical asset. Our reporters use computers, they use laptop. It's uh, you know writing and technology skills, and we in Houston have been used to going through a lot of disruptions ourselves through hurricanes. So you know the, you could be working from the office one day and a hurricane or storm comes through, and you got to move, you got to be mobile. So uh, most of our team through emergency preparedness was whether or not we liked it, we were actually in a good position to do it versus most companies. So uh, we, you know, when the spread began happening in Houston, <clears throat> you know, we put the order as out employees that, hey, we want to be safe. If everyone can, please just start working from home. And the transition was pretty seamless, quite honestly. I mean, we had, you know, so, some pros and cons with our working from home, but we were able to maintain good relations with our clients. We were able to get the data and the information we needed to keep our publications going. And you know, overall, it was a, a rather smooth transaction. Um, but you know, even, even for me, it was, it was different because I had a daughter, her first year starting was in pre-kindergarten and her first experience of learning was literally online with a computer. So think about that generation that she's completely used to it and if schools open today or close tomorrow it's it's seamless with her little ipad and continue learning with her and her friends so i mean it, it is it is kind of interesting to see how things have adapted and you know they're really honestly probably not going to go back to ever it was pre-covid i mean we're going to have some different version of what this may be in life in the world so um, I would have to say the first things most companies, we improved our technology really quickly, whether it was at home, whether it's upgrading computers or line, and, you know, whether it's using Zooms or Teams or internet conferences, all that changed. And it all changed pretty quickly and shockingly. And I think it's because, yes, uh, United States or here in Houston, we have the luxury of we're a, a, a very advanced city and we can move to those technologies very quickly. Um, not all our offices around the world have that ability, but I mean, fundamentally, Argus itself moved very quickly. We got our other offices up to speed and, and we caught on from that. But, um, you know, each office, though, is impacted differently. So, you know, Houston, while things are getting better, we still have COVID. It still exists. We're still dependent on the vaccination program. While things are improving here, we have offices in India and Brazil, and they are not doing well in that, wow. those countries that well. As COVID has taken off, the death rates have soared, and it's just a whole different situation. 
So while we're still globally connected, we're trying to now actually then help each other, support each other globally around the world. So we went from even a more you know, regional tribe base here, here in Houston, I already had global influences, but there are times if an employees are, are not feeling well or they need to be shut down, I'm covering meetings on the internet from China to Taiwan to around the world. As we've become more and more used to working collaboratively as a group internationally. So there have been some pros and cons that have come out with the, the conversion or the change. But, you know, on Argus, we do have our office open for the employees that want to do come. So if you're at home, work situation wasn't ideal, um, you know, and maybe you didn't have the space or the housing or an office or the Internet for our younger um, employees. The office was open and we converted those offices as we needed to to make them available for the, the people that wanted to work and stay and, and had to have more collaborative positions at home. But let, let's go back to that April 20th and say, wow, that was a sucker. <laughs> Negative $37.63. My gosh, I was sitting on my, uh, in my desk in my office when I was watching. I almost had to rub my eyes as it was completely collapsing down. COVID had taken off. It was beginning to rumble the economy. And then in the middle of a pandemic, we had a price war. And that price war was uh, aligned between Russia uh, and Saudi Arabia at the time in Houston and Canada was caught dead in the middle of this. The US at that moment was the largest producer of crude oil for the world. We were number one, we were on the top. And he, uh, Texas leading that way. So Houston was just the major oil hub. And as things went down, um, there was kind of a price reduction war. So more crude got flooded into the market by both Saudi Arabia and Russia as the politics between those countries flared. As the price of oil went down, as more became available on the market and the demand was less, the price of oil just kept buckling down and down and down. And it had significant impacts in our community because most of the oil in the United States, it's not government owned, it's privately owned. It's from businesses and mom and pops and companies and uh, the, the community. So the United States and Canada really took a big hit and that price of that uh, one day fell into the negative category, which just kind of signaled the world didn't need any more oil. We're kind of done at this particular 10 seconds as the oil in Cushing, Oklahoma filled up all the tanks, the storage went to the roof and they just, we can't take any more here. At that location, that part of the world, we don't need any more crew, we're done. And so as a result of the crude actually fell into the negative territory that uh, signaled a whole bunch of interesting ramifications behind that. So, you know, there were companies that had hedging programs, companies that didn't have hedging programs, that had financial securities that some didn't, some integrated, some not. Um, storage went through the roof in Houston, Texas, and then globally. Um, so everyone started filling up these oil tanks because Here's the thing, if you got oil pumping on the ground, it's not that easy just to shut it off. I mean, it's not just turn a well like your water faucet on the water. It's yeah. definitely much more complicated when you're out in the field to say shut it off, shut off the flare stack, shut off the well, the well pressures, all the drilling investments behind. You just can't go out and turn it off. So mm -hmm. as a result, that crew started getting stored everywhere. It got started, started storing on ships and ships started collecting out in the ocean just as big storage vessels and it just ramified across the entire world. And uh, we begin watching the crude prices begin stumbling in all these different areas. So it was a, a very unique uh, moment in time that I was there watching this happen. And since that time, the crude oil has, uh, has, um, has taken some different turns. So as global demand dropped in crude, there ended up being an OPEC alliance. So they cut more than 10 million barrels of crude off the global market. So they said, we're gonna, Saudi said, we're gonna produce less. Russia said, we'll produce less. Um, the United States, just by supply and demand and price impacts, we begin producing less because you're not gonna make money in oil. You're probably not gonna produce more wells. And so as a result, it kind of slowly over time as demands picked up, burned off these big giant global supplies, of crude oil that's around the world. And uh, it's just important to realize that, well, finally crude has now kind of gone up to, you know, I'm looking today around $60 in Cushing, $65 in Houston for a WTI barrel of crude, and it's looking stable here. So a big change that has happened in the course of a year. And if you think about it, that's a $100 swing in the oil price. 
And that's, that's an amazing movement that I've never quite seen in my life. And that's a lot of volatility and a lot of stability. So people look at, you know, companies like a media artist, like what is happening around the world in crude? It's not just enough to know what's happening to Midland or in Houston, you know, or Chicago. You have to know what's going around the entire world when you look at that commodity. And so here, I mean, we are very, very much typed into that. So everybody, whether they not like it or not in Houston, you are dependent on a global economy. The crude oils from here, they reach every part of the world. So we have clients that come in and they have offices from India, Korea, China, Thailand, all around the world. And you, you and your uh, WAC organization see these folks every day in here and it just reemphasizes the international community that we are. And so it is interesting in the development. And I, all I can say is I think the community is even tighter than it was before because we're forced now, even though we can't meet in person, to have that information go back and forth is even more critical than it was even in 10 years ago. So um, to me, even though I can't always meet my clients and interact, and we've all learned to adapt because we realize the importance of how quickly we do need each other and how quickly things like Zoom and Teams and uh, communication systems have gone globally. I and mean, it feels like it was overnight. Um, and so it's it's been a, a big move into that area. Um, we've also seen growth in other areas as a result of it, such as uh, hedging futures activities. So a lot of the banks will go out and put out freight forward or financial future contracts for different commodities, say, we don't want this type of volatility in the markets as much in the future. So a lot of banks have now been involved in the financials and investments to kind of shore up, particularly Texas in the Houston area, to protect us from these type of uh, price movements. So even though the price of crude may have gone down to maybe $36, and there, unfortunately there are some companies that have been acquired or gone out of business, a lot of the majors have survived and things are looking better. Um, so while we did have some layoffs and some downsizing in Houston, a lot of the economy is on its track to come back significantly. Very positive. So if you would have a crystal ball, what number are you seeing at the end of the year on a price per barrel? What is that possibly? Well, the, the, the simple answer, and the, it's, it's not simple, but we're gonna, you know, I discussed this with a few of my colleagues earlier. And we all kind of felt like this 60 to $65 range, where we are right now is probably going to hold. But there is a lot of chatter out there called a super boom. And what does that mean? Well, you know, a lot of us that are home, we got pent up demand, we want to go take a vacation, we want to go out, and we've seen the GDP in the United States go. We've seen it pick up in China. But keep in mind, that's not the whole world, and we are globally integrated. So the demand is actually falling in places like India and China as we speak. So while we may be even some outputs here and demand is up here in the United States, you know, the demand in the other parts of the world hasn't necessarily picked up. So a lot of this really comes down to the vaccination programs, how quickly can people be vaccinated? Um, how is that gonna affect the economy? And that, that is very inconsistent and choppy as well. So while the United States is moving up its vaccination programs, I mean, there are countries that are almost fully vaccinated, some that are not at all, and it's very inconsistent. So, you know, put yourself in a, a, a position if you had to go visit a, a major client like Reliance, uh, who has major refineries in India, do you even travel? Do you even go over there? What is their demand? What is their output at those refineries as we speak right now? The, the other thing is the curtailments or the willingness for OPEC to cut barrels, like I said at the beginning of the uh, and the pandemic, they have the right to put those barrels back online anytime they want. So if the price of oil goes up too high, it's attractive for them to say the demand for oil is, uh, has grown. And most likely they're going to be the first ones there to supply those barrels to the market. So it'd be very easy for the Saudis to go ahead and backfill the increase in demand. And they are in an easier position globally to do it than, let's say, even Texas or other parts of the world where we have to drill. They have big, giant oil reserves in those countries, and they can put those wells on pretty quickly to keep the price from booming too high and too quickly. So the truth is, even though in the United States, it may look from us that, hey, things are a mixed basket of recovering. They're looking better. You got, everyone's thinking, like, I can't wait to get on a flight or resume my life or get back on a vacation. Keep in mind, it's not global. And so a lot of it just depends on the rollout. So I think that we're in a good supply point. If, 
prices creep up a little bit in the oil and gas sector, we'll see new wells come online, starting probably the Middle East, moving then into the Russian areas. And then third case, or, you know, the United States will probably come back and put as a wells that may have taken offline, wells that may not have been as economic before uh, last year, uh, to put those back in line before drilling new wells. Um, so we're probably going to see the areas pick up that the existing production that we have, that we're going to maintain the Gulf of Mexico, the wells that we currently have across the United States, and continue on those programs. Um, refining margins still they're a little bit weak. And um, people are saying, why are they weak? I mean, I thought gasoline and diesel demand picked up in the US. So yeah, but keep in mind, we had gotten to the point in the United States that as we were the largest producer at one point of oil in the world, we were a net exporter. And our refinings was doing so well and the efficiency in the United States was doing so well that we were a net exporter of gasoline, diesel, particularly to Latin America. So as Brazil's hurting, they don't need that diesel. So the refining margins, well, they're not doing extremely well in certain commodities one way or another. So hence, you got to keep your eye on everything. It's all connected uh, in, in the uh, commodity sector. Yeah, and it, very much so. Just like we hear at the World Affairs Council, we'll look, of course, how the, you know, the global and local perspectives are connected. You just mentioned that those two definitely intersect and how they impact one another. Um, so it's, you had actually even earlier, one of the conversations mentioned that in Houston, we do not live in isolation as you had just, uh, you know, some great examples. And when you think of all the crisis that we are experienced and experiencing also how that is connected. If we think of the sort of recent Suez Canal crisis, right? Um, it, it felt like it was recent, but I think the situation has moved on and we almost have forgotten about it. And it's an and it's example of how the things have moved in the industry has progressed. So uh, the Suez Canal, which is kind of interesting. So um, one of the larger vessel classes that we have accrued is, and um, uh, in, in, by the way, in the United States on the U.S. Gulf Coast, we have these vessels called VLCCs, and there's only one location that can be loaded because it's such a big vessel, very large crude carrier, and that's over in Luke, uh, Louisiana. So that's an offshore buoy that hooks up everything else that when the ships have got to come in, the largest class ship that can fit in our ports, whether it's in for fully loaded vessels, whether it's in Corpus Christi or Houston or Beaumont or Port Arthur is a Suez Max vessel. And Suez Max means it's the maximum size vessel that can actually fit through the Suez Canal, which is about a million barrels of crude. Um, to give other perspectives, if you're not familiar with a million barrels, that's uh, approximately 42 million gallons of uh, crude oil. They're huge. These things look like skyscrapers if you've ever seen one up close. And uh, these vessels, you know, a big major transit route for crude to flow from the Middle Eastern market to Asia to other market was the Suez Canal. And when that one vessel stuck into that canal, wow, it backed up vessels all the way around. Now the oil market, it's it happens, and we see where things where ice flows sometimes. Uh, backup uh, vessels in the Danish Straits or fog come on the, the Middle East, uh, the Straits of Vermouth, or right now today we have backup of vessels that China's economy is taking off so well that they just can't get the vessels there quick enough into there. And they're literally backed off because they just can't get them unloaded. Yeah. And so it, as a result of just some logistical things, these happen, but what has happened is because of that global glut, we ended up with crude storage everywhere. So the impact was not what it used to be in the past. When I was a kid and I grew up here um, and a hurricane would come through, I remember there'd be gasoline outages. Cars would run out of gas, there'd be shortages. But now that you have more storage, we're better prepared for those things. And, uh, you know, and that's just the reality of globally around the world is to get more and more advanced. We have global storage in the other areas. So they're like, yeah, crude is knocked off. These are vessels on the water, reroute them to another part of the world, just move on because crude is fungible. Hey, you know what, that this vessel was routed to go one direction, we'll just send it to another on the water. And uh, yeah, the, the impacts were actually quite minimal if you looked at a price change in movement because the, the economy was able to absorb it. Yes, it went up a little bit, but it's not as in the old days when a hurricane came through and suddenly everyone's without a commodity the prices spike and the volatility is crazy. So 
it's it's been interesting to watch the shifts in those dynamics in the market. But yeah, I mean, it's still continuing to be at various levels in the United States. And even in subsectors in the market, like just recently in Houston, we had the this winter storms that went through. Mm-hmm. We had problems where uh, the electricity wasn't available in Houston. We watched the prices of electricity surge to record levels around here. But people are building generators. People are looking at alternative energy sources. People are looking at what they can do to shore up uh, to make sure that we have stable supplies in the future. So, you know, I idealistically and worldwide, I and mean, that these shocks and shocks of uh, price volatility movement should be coming down as the world just learns from one experience to another and just adapts. And as a result of it, you know, it's, the markets are looking calmer. Very much so. I want to shift a little bit, um, kind of even bigger topic or big topic in itself is energy world uh, currently. It moved towards renewables, green energy, uh, we've seen and heard different announcements, uh, initiatives that come from United you know, Airlines, uh, new emission goals, Shell, BP, others are all moving towards uh, diversification. Uh, there are ESG projects coming from companies like Kinder Morgan, Coke, others. What is uh, Argus's view and understanding of these changes or, or new ways to come? Well, we watch them and, you know, um, some of these things, whether they're carbon emission programs or energy credits that actually trade, we do evaluate biofuels and stuff in the market. So we have seen that sector grow, um, particularly in the U.S. and uh, the European markets. And what we're seeing, though, um, overall is the demand for hydrocarbons has not actually globally gone down because the thing is the world just, if you step back, just needs more energy. Mm -hmm. So the truth is we need all the above energy sources, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, whether it's nuclear. And when you look at all these things, there's an area in there that's uh, uh, called in particularly carbons and carbon emissions in which most of the industry is trying to reduce um, and meet various targets across these big energy companies. Some of them have moved to what I call electrification. And what does that mean? It's like, well, instead of running a motor, maybe we can run it on electricity. Maybe we can burn a few hydrocarbons. Um, You see a lot of the tankage that if you look down on the side of the road, whether you're driving from Corpus Christi or even around Houston, in the old days, we'd see these big old storage tanks. A lot of them, they're putting domes on the top of these. And people are, what is that dome for? And literally it's vapor recovery. So they put a dome on the top, if anything leaks out, it sucks up the methane, it brings it back in the pipeline system. And at bare minimum, you're, at bare minimum, if you can't use it, you're going to flare it or you use it within your own systems to generate power. And therefore, you conserve the energy and try to minimize the waste of it. Um, and even worse, you know, we don't want full um, things like methane le- leaking up into the environment. I, I know a lot of people get concerned when they see flare tanks burning on the side of the road. But keep in mind, that's a lot, lot better for the environment than if you just let the gas go up into the environment itself. And so the question is, you know, can we reduce them? Well, Europe and the US have been kind of in the forefront of taking on a lot of these initiatives and a lot of these companies are moving that direction. Globally though, um, pretty much all the work that we've done in the emission sectors between the US and, um, and Europe have been offset by increase in emissions around other parts of the world. So it is important to realize that, you know, it's, it's easy to sit there and tell other countries, whether it's India or China, please don't burn these chemicals, please don't use them, our emissions are going up. But the good news is, you know, with improved technologies and the US uh, leading uh, a lot of the more environmentally safe uh, programs in the United States, the technology has been getting better and better, particularly in second and third world countries. And while we're going in the United States, um, you know, is trying to go ahead and find diverse usages of whether it's solar, whether it's wind. And even that, even though they're leading edge and they're generally more environmentally friendly, they are alternatives and there are things like you cannot replace. Um, So an asphalt road is an asphalt road. I can't replace that with solar or wind or nuclear. That's just not chemically possible. And so there is still a lot of demand out there for whether I call the hard to replace uh, areas. So a lot of people like to look at transportation or other areas, but keep in mind the rubber tires, the plastic that builds the cars lighter, uh, you know, these hydrocarbons are in everyday life. So 
it's important to kind of look at things as an all of above strategy and to make sure that they're wisely used. And I think a lot of the good intentions have been put and led forward by the industry and by folks that want to go ahead and continue to see uh, improving or reduce carbon emissions globally. And I think that that's going to be in the path that we're going to be in the United States for quite a while. We're seeing more and more initiatives that are taken on, whether it's biofuels or diesels um, that are generated by big oil and gas companies. Um, they're trying to find better usages of these uh, around uh, emerging countries around the world. Now, keep in mind in Houston, pretty much all our vehicles, you know, most of them run on gas and then the rest of them on diesel. But there are people that have flexi fuel engines that run on compressed net gas. They, they, they run on propane um, and, and, and other types of energy sources, such as now we're seeing more um, you know, of energy vehicles that are taken off in different parts of the world. But again, keep in mind, there's pros and cons with every single type of energy usage, and it's a very complicated subject. So we have a lot of analysts uh, in our company that are, you know, we study these areas, we debate these areas among ourselves, so where they're going to go. And it's uh, always been just a fascinating area. So me, you know, I've been in that hydrocarbon space and yes, I have experts in my company that we do debate all the time of alternative energies and electricity and how they're going to be forming into the grids. And it's been just a very fascinating area to work in as a result of there's quite a brain trust in our company that we go ahead and as a result, we do consulting studies for a lot of government agencies and a lot of people around the world in these areas. And like I said, it, it's tricky because, like I said, you know, it's at the end of the day, we're all talking about mostly energy. And with energy, there's diverse ways of getting it. There's diverse ways of creating it. There's diverse ways of using it. And uh, the whole world wants more. So, you know, when people say, is oil going to go away? Well, we still, have, unfortunately, there are billions of people globally that are still in poverty that want to have improved lifestyles. They want to have electricity in the home. They want to have elect, you know, better conditions of air conditioning and, and water wells, whether it's in our hospitals. And you've got to step back and say, well, the world has a deficit of energy and all of these resources, all of these diverse alternatives are really needed globally. So even if it may or may not always make sense here in the United States, we may see windmills in Houston or Corpus Christi or whatever freeze during an ice storm, but it's important that technology does learn to work here because think about where that can be adapted to many other places in the world that don't even have running water. So, I mean, it is very critical that, that Houston is a leading, leading expert uh, globally in the sense that it has energy and it uses all different diverse types. So it's kind of interesting to watch that develop and then see those technologies do, um, you know, utilized in many different parts of the world. Well, that's a, a great way to almost come to the end of our, our discussion of being the, you know, what the, the role of Houston in the global um, work, in the global arena, I would say. Uh, Bruce, I think I've shared with you that uh, we here at the council work a lot with students and it's where we're proud of, uh, proud of uh, high school students, university students, and I keep saying that we are all students of life. We, you and I, everybody learn something every day. Uh, and uh, we have some interns that uh, are, have joined our team and uh, I had reached out to them. Interns and also high school student participants in anticipation of this dialogue. And um, some of them had uh, submitted questions for me to ask you. So these following questions were coming from our high school students. Um, uh, Joel asks you, who do you look up to as a source of inspiration? Well, you know, I had actually thought about this for a while because I didn't have like a straightforward answer. Is, is it Gandhi? Is it uh, some philosopher? Is it some patriarch or saint? Um, yeah. and, and I'll be honest, I, I had to stop and think about it. One of the biggest influencers I've had in my life were really came down to my, my family and the community that she grew up in. And um, to this day, even though, you know, you can sit there and say, you know, as I get older, I have different skill sets than my parents. It's the wisdom of just treating people um, fairly in life. It's the, the wisdom of having great parents that support you in your initiatives in life. So I, I honestly just take it back and I look back at my parents as one of the greatest inspirations for me because, uh, you know, they raised a, 
four kids. Uh, we all went to college. They never did. We were the next generation that uh, went ahead and progressed in front of them. And if you look at back and you think as a, you know, as a more adult at my age, the sacrifices that they made for us children to go ahead and get a good education, to have good stability in life, to be raised in a, a good house and to have a hot meal on the table is really, really, I think, a fundamental key to life. And you know, I, I do appreciate my parents significantly for putting that, uh, the, the church and the support group that we had in the community that I grew up in. So a lot of, you know, whether it's your teachers or schools, it's the people that who, who created you in your life and made you are the greatest influence and the greatest people that I do look up to in my life. And, uh, you know, even though I may be in a different spot or maybe a more executive career than they've had, it doesn't matter. I look at who the people I have and say, wow, what do they do to, uh, to elevate me? And then it, it forces me to look at myself in, inside and say, well, this is why I volunteer on the advisory board at the university, because I'm going to give back to the community that gave to me. And so I, I just want for everyone to keep in mind as a young person, when you grow and you're strong, make sure to give back to the supportive community that bring you up. Wonderful, very, very well said. Uh, next question is kind of career related. Again, as these individuals uh, move up into their education and eventually workforce, Elian asks us, what do you consider before promoting someone? So, you know, a lot of it has to do with have they done a good job in their existing role? Have they mastered their skill sets? How do they work with other coworkers, their personality? And, you know, do they have the ambition that they want to move up? I mean, keep in mind, not everybody knows. If you're a young person, I think the most important thing is to have a good communication line with your employer. If you want to move up into another role or to another area, you need to talk with them so they're aware of it. You know, it's very easy as a manager said so that person looks happy every day and so maybe that's what they want to do for their career and that's where they want to be but you've got to realize well as a young person that you have to master the skills that you're in to show me or show the employer that you're really good at what you've done before you can move on to the next level and if you've done that and you've mastered your skill and you feel like you want more responsibilities and you're ready to reach out and improve, that's when the, the conversations really start engaging into, hey, I think you're ready for the next promotion because you've done a good job. You've uh, told the line on getting the work done, you've been on time. And uh, especially with younger people, it's like it's very important to that maturity um, to make sure that you have that established, be to work on time, be polite. You know, somebody may be having a bad day at work and it's up to you just to be emotionally mature and deal with it and be nice and uh, productive and getting things done. And when you become a reliable, stable person at work, yes, promotions almost always in line for that person. So um, the hard thing, I think, for a lot of folks is sometimes having the patience and understanding what the guidelines is uh, for that, you know. Um, to, the road to the track to be from an intern to CEO doesn't always happen in six months or a year. Um, it may take a little bit longer and, and realigning uh, those expectations sometimes will actually make you a happier employee. So when you know where you're at and you know what the expectations are and you know what the reality is, are you in, within your company? And I think it just makes for a happier person. And most likely, you know, if you do everything well and you're well-spoken and you are a polite person, it, the cards are for most people for advancement. And, uh, and keep in mind, everyone, everyone's goals change in life. So a promotion you may get as a young person is going to be very different as a promotion when you get older. Your skills, what you want, and your desires change as you move in life. You know, maybe you want a, a very highly global international career chasing job like I've had. Um, when you're early on and you don't have any ties, you know, maybe have a property or house or family. Sure, that sounds fantastic. As you get older, maybe you do have a family. Maybe you do have property you have to take care of. Maybe you have older parents you got to take care of. And then your, your desires may change of saying, I'm not sure I want to be on the road as much as I want. Maybe I want to do more things locally. So keep in mind, there's always a career path of when you're 20, 30, 40, 50, and so forth. So, you know, your mindset's change. So sometimes you got to plan for the older self, not the self that you are today. Thank you. Uh, Faith is asking, at what point in your life did you really know what you wanted to do with your career? You know, I, I, I was going to say, like, you know, things always evolve and change. And I can tell you when I was early on in my career, and I couldn't quite match up what I wanted, but I kind of knew who I was. You know, I like speaking. 
I, I like networking with people. I loved international travel when I was younger. I just liked going out and visiting different places. And uh, early on in my career, I knew I wanted to be something in that area. But then I began to stop back and think, I grew up in Houston. So what fits that criteria? Right. So to me, the oil and gas sector had those international aspects that I wanted. And so that's where I begin to marry those on and chase them into early in my career. And I would have to say, honestly, it was probably somewhere around the middle of my college when I was studying uh, Soviet economics and resources. And I realized that Russia and other places had all these reserves of oil and we didn't have a lot of experts being in Houston. I said, hey, I want to go do that and learn that. And I chased it and I pursued it. And I started doing, walking, going to embassies and working around the world. And I, I went after it and as an intern, unpaid, no money. I mean, but that's not what I was after that life. I wanted the experience and the opportunity. And, uh, you know, from a young age, that's what I wanted. Now, did I even know oil and gas journalism existed like it is today back then? That really didn't, you know. And sometimes you've got to be on a career path to just take the skill sets and you build. So my main thing is to stay true to yourself. You know, if you're, if you want to live in Houston, we have great, you know, medical, we have great hospitals, we have tons of diversification that, uh, you know, Sonia, you and others are, uh, are very familiar with in Houston and, you know, say, hey, these are career options. But, you know, if you want to grow, you know, oranges, maybe you're better off in Florida and California. So knowing where you want to be is a big key of it aligning the businesses that are available with your interests is a really critical. If you want to be an actor, maybe Hollywood or New York, right? So it's aligning the city with the skill set and the desire that you have all really do need to come in line um, to make a career successful. So for me, I mean, those fell in part of saying, hey, I know who I like. I like talking, I like networking, I'm a people person, I'm an extrovert. Um, and as a result of it, I think I didn't exactly knew what I wanted, but I knew I didn't want to be a dentist. I knew I, I didn't want to be a doctor. I knew I didn't want to be an accountant because that didn't fit my personality. So early on, even if you don't feel like you know exactly 100% what you want, stay true to what it is that you enjoy life and it will find out your way to it. Um, I think with the, uh, those wise words, uh, we have really come already to hold our uh, discussion that we are about to close. I'm going to say thank you, Bruce, for your time. I'm going to say thank you uh, to our viewers, our friends, neighbors, students, uh, all of you for being, again, interested in global affairs and how those global affairs are connected to us locally and vice versa, what we do here, how it affects others globally. Bruce, any uh, closing remarks on, on your side? Yeah, you know, I'd like to thank the World Affairs Council of uh, Greater Houston uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, and also congratulations on your 50th year anniversary and that you guys have been an inspiration and a backbone in this community. We do really appreciate your, your advice and wisdom uh, in guiding the uh, World Affairs Council as well. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Again, with that, I'm going to say thank you, Bruce, to you. Uh, thank you to everybody. Wish a fantastic weekend ahead uh, as we started by being healthy and safe. Uh, I wish the same thing. Stay healthy and safe. And we cannot wait to see all of you in person, to be with you in person and stay strong. We know that is going to happen relatively soon. Again, with that, wish you a happy weekend. All the best and we'll be in touch. Thank you again. Bye-bye. All right.